This morning, I want to start looking at an idea that will continue through the rest of this month, and it's this, give thanks. Give thanks, okay? This is an important time. We think about Thanksgiving's coming up uh, the last Thursday, and our theme verse that we'll kind of be working around uh, today, but then carrying through the rest of the month is this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Always rejoice, constantly pray, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this idea this morning that I want to talk about is give thanks at all times. Give thanks at all times. And you know, when you face situations like, I I can promise you I did not, um, I was not giving thanks when I stuck my key in my car and turned the, the, the key and nothing happened except ding, 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 as my door dinger was going. I was thinking, oh man. In hindsight, I can look back and say that, you know what, God was in control at that moment. My groceries didn't go bad. I got a ride home pretty quickly. You know what, in fact, when I went back to get it, I didn't have to pay for a tow service. Even though my insurance has roadside assistance, it's still a claim on my insurance. I didn't want to have to do that again. It started up, and I was like, by the grace of God, it started. I'm not taking it any further than to the automotive shop that I trust across the street, right? I looked back and I thought, you know what? How different would my whole evening have been had I given thanks in that moment? Rather than getting frustrated, rather than being upset, rather than thinking, oh man, I got to spend money I don't have. God was saying, I've got the money. You just don't have it in your hand yet. God said, you know what? You're going to get it without, you, I know you don't want to have to call your insurance and have another ding on your, on your insurance, I've got it taken care of. And when, he, when, when he's writing here, Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica, he's saying, give thanks in everything at all times. You know, the, as we look at the verses surrounding this, we can go to that next slide. I think it has the title. Oh, and then the, that's what I was, was going to say. Thank you. I looked, those are all thank you in different languages. But the next one, if you would, and the next one. We look at the first point here, and... As we're thinking of giving thanks at all times, we should give thanks for God-given leadership. Okay? Paul's writing to the, to the Thessalonians, and he says this in verses 12 to 13. He says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who labor among you and preside over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them most highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. There's a lot of stuff wrapped up in those couple of verses as we look at that today. You know, it's, it's not just talking about pastors, right? I mean, we could specifically apply that to our situation, but we have other leaders in the church that God has placed in leadership that do this, right? They, they admonish us in the Lord, right? We have people in our lives that do that. And what's he saying? Brothers and sisters, acknowledge these people. And you did that for me last week, and I, Mel and I really just— I, we were overflowing with the joy and the things that we, we felt for you. And he says, esteem them most highly in love. It means that you don't, you know, we were, uh, Mel was in Detroit, and um, Marvin Winans as a pastor there, Perfecting Praises Church, and um, their church and Mel's home church did a lot of things together. And I remember they were talking one pastor appreciation, and the church at Perfecting bought him a Porsche once. And they drove it right up, in front of the church and put a, I'd probably put a bow on or something and gave it. And he came to speak at Mel's uh, home church and it was on a main street, Woodward Ave in, De- in Highland Park near Detroit. And when, when Pastor Marvin showed up, he didn't park that thing on the street. He didn't put it in the gated lot across the street. He pulled that sucker right up onto the sidewalk underneath the marquee of the church and parked it right there because no, nobody's going to mess with his pastor appreciation gift. Now, I'm not saying you have to go to those extravagant means. What's he say? Esteem them highly in love. You know what's interesting is he goes on to say, be at peace among yourselves. Do you think it's coincidence that Paul gives an instruction for peace after saying, esteem God-given leadership highly in love? No, because it's often our differences that we might have with leadership that cause us to disrupt the peace that should be promoted in this place. 
well, I don't agree with the pastor. He didn't do this. I don't agree with deacon so-and-so. He wants to do this, and I don't think that's the right thing that we should do. And we start running our mouth and talking and causing troubles and starting fights and putting junk on Facebook and writing letters and calling, texting people, and then down the line, and then it comes back around to deacon so-and-so. You know what? Sister who and who doesn't even like you. Well, why didn't she come to me in the first place? Is that how we're to treat leadership? No. Esteem them highly in love. And in doing that, promote peace. Live at peace one with another. Don't be the person that's always talking. And you know what? Every church has got them. And I just want to take them out and give them a holy throat chop. Stop running your mouth. If I hit you in the larynx hard enough, you will not be able to talk for a while. You know what I mean? It's frustrating. So and so is talking again. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to be a drama filled church. Let's be a love filled church. Let's be a peace filled church. Let's take what the word says and say, yep, that's me. When I have a disagreement, I, the only person I'm taking it to is the Lord. And I'll trust that he'll work it out. You know what? If this church is truly the body of Christ, then Jesus is the head. And as the head, he will speak to the leadership and direct him if we will listen. If we will listen. We've got to be people of peace. We've got to promote. He says, acknowledge, love, admonish the leadership that God has given you. You know, and in this letter, we know that there were probably, this is not a new thing. This, this problem in the church of people causing division is not new. It was happening in Thessalonica. It was happening with these believers that Paul is writing to. People were being disrespectful. They're fighting with the leadership. You know, in, in studying war, I found this quote from Warren Wearsby. He said, I have discovered that lack of respect for spiritual leadership is the main cause of church fights and splits. Let me read that again because I thought that was good. I had discovered that lack of respect for spiritual leadership is the main cause of church fights and splits. You know, some people live in this world and they think, like, denominations are all bad. They're, they can be. You can get so wrapped up in denominational issues that you forget that the church universal, you know, the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the Catholic Church. It's not talking about Holy Cross at the top of the hill. The word Catholic means universal in the Apostles' Creed. Do you ever know the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, conceived of a virgin, you know, the whole on and on. I believe in the Catholic Church. It means universal church. So we can't get so wrapped up in our identity as an Assembly of God church that we can't have fellowship with other believers in other churches. We, we need to have that. But, you know, there is a safety in many denominational structures that we find. It's an umbrella covering. If you hire a pastor and he goes completely off the rails and left base, you have leadership in place that can come in and step in and intervene in that situation and put a stop to it. You know, we faced some difficult times in these last, this last year, and I thank God for the leadership that we have that has come alongside us and been shepherds to us, saying this is the—because we've had some ideas as the board, as the leadership, and they came in and said, that's, that's not a good idea. Why? Because they've seen it go that way, the wrong decision made, and they've seen the effect that it has. And so I thank God for them. So we have to understand God places spiritual leadership, and it's our job to respect that leadership. You know, it's not to say you can't have a disagreement and come and have a conversation with somebody, that it, but don't let that conversation be with somebody that has no power in the situation. That's called gossip. When you have a problem with somebody, the only body that you can go to to discuss that problem is the somebody you have a problem with. When you go to somebody else, you're not doing conflict resolution. You're spreading gossip. You're causing division, and you're going strictly against the Word of God. Can we understand that? 
Paul's saying this problem happened in Thessalonica. These Thessalonians were guilty of it. Here's what you do. Respect and love your leaders. Admonish them. Encourage them because they admonish you. Live at peace. Be people of peace. These little words, it says this. Those who labor among you and preside over you. The last part, in the Lord. In the Lord. That means God placed them there. Jesus has a purpose for them being there. Some people think it's their purpose to oust the people that they think God didn't place there. <laughs> you know? I, unfortunately, I was talking to a pastor last week, and we were talking about that. I, I've known of this church for a long time and some of the history they felt, and, and I found out there were some, some pillars that I saw as pillars in the church, and they left a number of years back, and he finally kind of shared with me the reasoning behind it. And he said, you know what? Since they left, we've, the, the whole atmosphere has changed. The, the, the culture is different. We're now growing. People have a freedom and a liberty because these people were seemingly dissenting behind the scenes and causing divisions and trying to do things themselves rather than taking it to leadership. This fighting... Let me tell you, encourage you this. If, if the main cause of fights and splits is, is disrespect for the leadership, a guy named Leon Morris in his uh, commentary, the epistles to the Thessalonians, he said this, leaders can never do their best work when they're subject to carping criticism from those who should be their followers. So that means, if that's true, that a leader can never do their best work if all they're hearing is criticism, 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 then you can help a leader do their best work by what? Encouraging. Encouraging, being thankful for them. Saying, you know what, I support you. And when you don't see fully the full support for their vision, you go to them privately and say, can you explain this a little bit further? Because I'm kind of seeing it a different way and we can have a discussion. It's beautiful when you can have a discussion that doesn't lead to a fight, isn't it? That's the hard line because we kind of put, our, I want to talk to you for a minute. We put our walls up. We put our defenses up. But I've seen a culture change even in this body in the last year where we have more discussions versus arguments. I told, let me just tell you, I, uh, two, two months ago we, we had our board meeting, and it wasn't four hours long, and we were all saying, praise God, thank you, Lord. Some of us forgot our lunch, and it's not forever. And then I got to the end, and we were getting ready to dismiss. I said, you know what I just realized? We've had more laughing in this meeting than anything else. Because, yeah, we got business done. We made decisions. We moved forward. But we were joyful in it. And let me just encourage you with that. No, it, the board as it is now, is the culture has changed. It's different as I see it. And, and there is a lot of joy and laughter in the process versus arguments and fights. That's a good thing. So if you want your leaders to do their best work, don't be guilty of constantly criticizing and courage. You know, we look back, we just saw the Game 7 of the World Series. All of us were probably rooting for the Royals, hoping, that, uh, hoping they would win, hoping something would happen. We probably all despise uh, Mr. Buck and his love affair, his, his uh, man romance with... Uh, uh, bum gardener, you know, uh, that guy was in love with him, you know, he could do no wrong in his eyes. Um, you know, we could even look at, at the lady that's saying, God bless America, and I was like, huh? Uh, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and as she tried to, I don't know, remix that song, and then changed keys accidentally, and went off pitch at the end, I was like, oh, this is hurting my brain for you to do this. You know, we, we could all look at that game, and if we were watching, we could probably point out something that we didn't agree with. Ned Yo should have done something different. The people that, that picked that lady should have tested her a little better before they said, hey, you want to come and sing God Bless America? We, we, we do that after, you know, you watch a Chiefs game, and you're what? Armchair quarterback in the whole game. You know, I was watching uh, last night K-State. Now, they just, you know, they whooped, they, they kicked butt in that game. They, they, there's no, you can't argue with what they did. There was one drive, seven points for Oklahoma State, and then KU responded like unanswered, or K-State responded unanswered. KU was a different story. They got, they got beat pretty severely. But, um, 
You know, we, we like to sit back and put our spin and put our, our input, don't we? When we, when we watch, it's, it's everything from a sport, a sporting event, a game we watch on TV. Uh, you know, you go to a party and the way the cake's made or the way the food's put out. Oh, I would have done something that's completely different with that. You know, that's something that is just unfortunately part of our human nature that we see and want to criticize. That means that it's got to be something supernatural to overcome to rather than criticize and courage. To rather, you know, I've been filling out, Mike asked me how my search is going, and I filled out lots of questionnaires. And one of the questions was, what bugs you most about church and church people? And I said, people that only want to criticize and don't offer a solution. If you think it's wrong, I'm fine if you want to come and tell me, but don't just leave me hanging with this is wrong and bye. You better come ready with, I think this might work better so we can try something different, right? Can we all agree? We don't want somebody coming to criticize. Offer a solution and give some encouragement. You know, it's like last week we were talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. How did Jesus start that letter to the church? He said, you're doing these things so well. He started with encouragement. He started with, uh, with lifting people up, with admonishing them that you're doing a great, these things are, are on track. But I have this against you, right? He started with the encouragement, then he brought the correction. Can we take that as a model of maybe that's how I need to start operating? Maybe that's something I need to do. You know, the old saying goes, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, but sometimes if you're so squeaky, other people are going to miss out on the oil that they need. Some wheels are constantly squeaking, and all the resources are going to that when there's so many other areas of need that need to be addressed. So one, and think, being thankful or giving thanks at all times, be thankful for God-given leadership. And that's the important factor, God-given leadership. Even in our world, what are we supposed to do with our government-appointed leadership? What's the word say? Pray for them. Yeah? Pray for them. Pray for our president and vice president and his cabinet. Pray for our senators. Pray for our congressmen. Pray for our, our mayor here in Kansas City. Pray for the leadership in the city that you live in. Pray for our state government. Pray especially for the Department of Secondary Education. Desi needs some prayers right now in Missouri. You know that? I'm mean, just uh, working with Desi this summer. They need some prayer. <laughs> Lots of prayer. Let me encourage you. Pray for God-given leadership. The second thing, give thanks for your weaker brother. Give thanks for your weaker brother. Verses 14 and 15, he, Paul goes on to say, we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the undisciplined, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient towards all. Ooh, I'm not a patient person. That one hits me right in the heart. And I'm like, oh man, I just told you guys I want to throat chop people, you know? That shows a lack of patience. Verse 15, see that no one pays back evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Sorry, I can hear the organ squeaking, and it is like a feather in the back of my ear. Um, we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the undisciplined, comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient toward all. See that no one pays back evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. Paul just talked about being thankful for the God-given leadership in your life, and now he is encouraging all the believers to be responsible in ministering to one another. You see that? Every member of minister is how you could remember that. The pastor doesn't have to do anything. Let me tell you, I, I went to see... Um, Sherry in the hospital. I'm glad she's out. And then I went across the street. Uh, Pam Bird's grandson, Daniel, was in the hospital, and I went to see my little, my little buddy. And, and uh, if every hospital stay could be like his hospital stay, I would be like, yes. Why? Because he got video games, TV. His lunch was nachos. You know, if you've been to Truman, your lunch is like an undressed, bland turkey sandwich. Yeah, that's not how you want. He's getting all, I said, man, I wish, I want to come here. And the nurse said the same thing. She goes, I know, I wish I could come here when I need to go to the hospital. This is great. So I walk in and he's like, Pastor T.R., who told you I'm here? And I said, who do you think told me you're here? And he goes, my grandma? Uh, yes. 
sit down, sit on my bed, let's play video games. And so we played video games for a few hours, you know. There's, mom needed a little break to go get some lunch. So Nikki and her friend went and got some lunch. I hung out with Daniel while they they got a little break, you know. I said, man, I wish every hospital visit was like this. Sit down, play some video games. And, uh, but you know what? That, the, the pastor doesn't have to be the only one that goes to see someone in the hospital. You know, Brother Ted uh, was just talking about love, real genuine love and showing love in Sunday school this morning. And we can all do that. You know, you don't have to have papers with the Assemblies of God to minister to somebody that's in need. Look, Paul's encouraging people simply. He says, admonish the undisciplined. In other words, when you see people that are neglecting just the basics of Christianity, encourage them. Stir them up into action to do something more. If you see somebody that's missing, look around you right now and think, who's missing this week? There's quite a few. (laughs) Make it a point to the ones that sit near you, call them. Get their number from the Welcome Center if you don't have it, and call them and encourage them. Hey, we missed you at church on Sunday. Maybe they're sick and they need somebody to pray for them. Maybe they would like somebody to just stop by and, and visit with them. Each and every one of us could find some point to do that. You know what? I, uh, Sister Catherine Wallace who used to sit right here. I remember whenever um, I was sick or Mel was sick, it was pretty sure thing that I would get a handwritten note in the mail from her. Whenever I was on her heart, sometimes I would just get this handwritten note of encouragement in the mail from her. And that's something we don't get too much anymore with email. It's so easy to jump on Facebook or, or shoot a text message or something. But she would take the time and write out, and it was not, I say short, it was never a short. It was usually a page, front and back, t- folded up, tucked inside a little card that she got from somewhere and, and dropped in the mail. And I, you know what's funny? I remember those things when I think of Catherine. That's what I remember about her. What do people remember about you? He says, admonish the undisciplined. You see someone that's slipping a little bit? Show them a reason to do something about it. Don't just say, hey, man, you're slipping, you're falling, you're, you're failing at this. No, come in and encourage them. Stir them up to have some action. He says, comfort the discouraged. He's not talking to the pastor. He's talking to the people. You know somebody that's discouraged? You can come and tell me about it. I might not know, but I'm probably going to tell you, you know what, you should maybe give them a call if God's laying them on your heart. That's for a reason. The Holy Spirit's doing that for a purpose. You know, tell me about it. I'll join with you in praying for them. But if it's you that the Lord put on their, uh, you put them on on your heart, then you do something about it. It's like you might come to me, Juan said, hey, I got an idea for trunk or treat. Run with it, brother. Do it. Right? And he did it. And he said they had a good turnout. Even in the cold. It was like 20 degrees outside. (laughs) You know? He says, comfort the discouraged. Cheer up those that are just downtrodden. They're just pushed down. They're, they, they, they don't see a hope or a future. Cheer them up. Give them some encouragement. Bring something that will stimulate them to press through the pain. You know, I was reading a, a John Piper devotional this week, and he said some of the deepest things in Christ are learned through suffering. Do you realize that's true? Some of the deepest things that we learn in life happen because we suffer. And we all need somebody to help us when we're pushed down, when we're discouraged. Help the weak. You know, some people just haven't learned yet to rely on Jesus for everything they need. And it's a process. I would say a lot of us are learning that full reliance on Christ. And Paul's encouragement here is help those people. Give them a testimony of how God met your need when you were there. Just like I had my car broke down. Don't know what to do. Don't know which part. I can't just go start buying all these parts and putting them in. Yeah, a starter's only four screws, but I don't know for sure if it's the starter. I don't know if it's the ignition switch. I don't know if it's the alternator. I can't be, I don't think it would be that. But, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, I kind of know some parts, but I don't know which one. I needed some, some specific direction on how to get it done. But then, I, you know, I found that person and God provided the funds to pay that person. So he can do the same for you. I'm no special person. 
Well, in God's eyes, I'm no more special than you, Eddie. God loves us the same, right? We're all his children. And what, you know, God doesn't show favoritism to his children, does he? I know sometimes we have favorites. All parents will agree. There's probably a child you had a favorite. I, I have, my sister's got nine kids. I've got one that's a favorite, you know, and I'll tell her, and then maybe the rest of them hopefully don't know that, that he's my favorite. But God doesn't have favoritism in his children. You can help the weak. And then he says this, be, be patient toward all. That's the hard thing. When you see people that are weak, that are discouraged, that are undisciplined, it's easy to get impatient with those people. How can we keep falling over the same thing all over again? And Paul's reminding us, as, as every member is a minister here, and you're ministering to those that are le- the, the weaker brother in the situation, you've got to have patience. And if you're like me and don't have patience, you've got to say, Holy Spirit, help me be patient. Help me to t- shut my mouth. Right? Be patient toward all. Don't be quick to point out other people's faults. Be patient and help them grow in Christ. Yeah? See, we're all in the race, but some of us are at different points in the race than others. And and we've got to be patient with the brother that's that's lagging behind a little bit in the race. And trust that God's going to work it out in them. Some people are just learning to walk in Christ. And they need our full patience. Just like you're patient with a baby that's learning to walk. You know what, they, they fall down and you cheer because that helps them get back up, right? Can we apply that spiritually? We see a weaker brother that's learning to walk in Christ and they fall down. Can we cheer them to get back up and keep going? Then he says this, promote non-retaliation and pursue what is mutually beneficial. Promote non-retaliation and pursue what is mutually beneficial. Instead of retaliating, we should promote being good towards all. And rather than over, being overcome by evil, we should overcome evil with what? Good. Mel's famous saying is, kill them with kindness. If someone is unkind towards you, be extra kind towards them. See, we're, we're, we're to be thankful for God-given leadership, and we're to be thankful for our weaker brothers and sisters you know i'm guilty of getting frustrated and worn out with some people i look back in my life of of guys i've tried to disciple and they just didn't have any inkling in their heart to really grow in christ and i feel like i've wasted time effort money materials and resources on these people but if i'm being obedient to what god is telling me to do then i've not wasted anything my my job is not to see that they have a response my job is to help, encourage, admonish, be patient, and trust that God will do the rest. I would say, Lord, let your word transform who I am and how I see other people. Let your word transform who I am, and let my life reflect what you're truly teaching us here today. I would encourage you, make that your prayer this week. The third thing is this simple reminder, give thanks in everything. Give thanks in everything. Verses 16 to 18, he says, Always rejoice, constantly pray, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you want to know God's will for your life, Paul says it right here. Always rejoice, constantly pray, and in in everything give thanks. You know, verse 16 is a tough one. Always rejoice. How can we constantly rejoice when we get the the flat tire in rush hour, when we get an unexpected bill that we just can't afford, when we suddenly get sick in the midst of the busy holiday season, when we experience the loss of a loved one? Are we supposed to rejoice in that loss? When you lose your job, when you get in a fight with a friend or your spouse, or you just experience the tragedies of life, you're supposed to rejoice? That's That's counterintuitive. That goes against how we really feel. So how do we rejoice at all times? It changes, it takes a change of perspective. It takes a complete change of perspective. I was looking at a a video this week, and it was, it looked like you're looking through a porthole. You guys know what a porthole is inside of a ship, just a round window. And it showed this piece of art that was like this 3D face. It was, it was a rendering of somebody's face. And the camera began, you know, you see this clear, you know, it was a man's face, had a man's haircut, eyebrows, a mustache, and nose. And, and so you see this face clearly through this porthole. 
this little window. But as the camera panned from that little circle window to the side, it became evident that each one of the features in that piece of art was a separate piece hanging from a string at a different depth. So when you look completely from the side, all you could see were individual pieces hanging on individual strings at varying depths away from this white wall. That's our perspective. We only see bits and pieces of the picture from the side. You see, when God is looking, his perspective, he sees how each and every one of those pieces fits into the whole, and he sees the entire completed picture. See, his perspective is completely different. And when we're focused on just what is happening here and now, what I have to do tomorrow, all we get is that side perspective looking at the individual pieces. But when we begin to say, Lord, give me an eternal perspective. Help me to see from your point of view. He, be, he can begin to shift and transition and bring us to a point that we're always rejoicing. In, in every situation, why do I rejoice? Because I know that God's going to work things out. I'm a child of God, and he gives good gifts to his children. So I know he's going to take care of me. And that's sometimes what we have to say to ourselves to remind ourselves in the situation we're faced with. We got the flat tire on the side of the road. Maybe he was keeping you from a fatal accident five miles down. You don't know. Remember, God sees the whole completed picture. We just see the perspective side sometimes. Change our focus, Lord. Paul goes on to say in verse 17, constantly pray. You know, I think about this. Are we supposed to just go throughout our day praying hours on end and, and never, never stopping? You know, we, we can't pray and drive if we pray with our eyes closed, can we? Lord, uh, I, I'm just trusting you're going to help me not hit anybody. I'm praying today as I drive to work. No, that's not what he's talking about. The Greek writers in the adverb that is translated without ceasing also use that word to describe a hacking cough. We've all had a hacking cough, right? What do we do? We cough when we need to get something out, right? It's not like we cough and cough and cough and cough and cough. If you do that, you wake up with really sore chest muscles and your back hurts and your body aches because you've been coughing all day. But a, a persistent hacking cough, it just, when you have something that needs to come out, you've got to cough. There's no help. So if we apply that to prayer, as I go throughout my day and I feel the need to pray, what do I do? Pray. I have a conversation with my father. I don't have to stop and find a church and kneel down at an altar and close my eyes and turn on worship music and have the perfect right setting. I can just say, hey, God, I'm driving right now, and I don't know what's going to happen in this meeting I'm going to, but I need your wisdom, so Lord, speak to me. Holy Spirit, direct me today. As you're putting, you know, gas in your car at the station, you know you got to go in. You know, you might see somebody. Lord, I'm going to pray for this person right here I see walking down the road with a hot dog in their hand. I just, I don't know why, but I feel like I need to pray for them. Be constantly in prayer. Be in a point that no matter where you are throughout your day, you could stop what you're doing, and you can vocalize a prayer, or you can internalize a prayer, because the both can happen. And God hears them both. How do I know? I used to only think you got to pray out loud all the time. Until what? God took my voice away. And then I could no longer pray out loud or worship out loud. A lot of things became internal, and I realized there's power when you can just meditate quietly on the Lord. And you could do that throughout your day while you're at work. You could be doing your work and just thinking about the Lord, being prayer. He says, be constantly in prayer. Again, Leon Morris said, if we live in this way, conscious continually of our dependence on God, conscious of his presence with us always, conscious of his will to bless us, then our general spirit of prayerfulness will in the most natural way overflow into uttered prayer. It is instructive to read again and again in Paul's letters the many prayers that he interjects. Prayer was as natural to Paul as breathing. And at any time, he was likely to break off his argument or to sum, up, sum it up by some prayer or of greater or less length. In the same way, our lives can be lived in such an attitude of dependence on God that we will easily and naturally move in to the words of prayer on all sorts of occasions, great and small, grave and happy. Prayer is to be a constant. Be constantly in prayer. Throughout your day, be in prayer. You don't have to just start your day at mealtime and end your day with your, you know, wake up prayer. Lord, thanks for this day. Or mealtime prayer. Lord, thanks for this food. Or bedtime prayer. Lord, thanks for this bed. It can be more than that. It can be deeper than that. 
continue a conversation that goes with God from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. You know, verse 18 gets to the heart of the matter. And it says that it's God's will for your life that you give thanks. That you rejoice always, that you constantly pray, pray and that in everything you give thanks. Always rejoicing means that our, our minds are set on eternity and not just a temporary life. Praying constantly keeps the line of communication open between us and our Father in heaven. And giving thanks in everything helps us to remember that God is working all things together for our good. How do I know that? Because Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Be thankful because you don't know what God is working in you. You have no idea what God is planning for your life. You know, in reading that devotional this week from John Piper, and he said, The deepest things in Christ are learned through suffering. There's nowhere in my journey that I would have been thankful that I was diagnosed with cancer. At no point was I, oh, thank God I get to have a biopsy on my mouth. Thank God I get to have radiation that burns like the worst sunburn I've ever had. Thank God that I have this chemo that makes me vomit all week long. But in looking back, God did something in me that he never could have done otherwise. You know what? I, I remember someone gave my wife a book that said, um, uh, all sickness is sin. And I, I really wanted to chop somebody in the throat at that moment. Because I heard people say the same thing to me. But I knew my word enough. You know what? I knew my word enough to know that when Jesus saw a man blind from birth, the, the disciples said, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What did Jesus respond? Neither. This happened so that the glory of God may be seen. And I took that and I held on to it because I got the smoker's cancer. I got the alcoholic's cancer, and I've never been either. You know what? So when people ask me for a cigarette, I tell them, nope, I already had your cancer. Not for me, sorry. So I, I, I look back and I say, you know what, in the midst of the situation, I hadn't learned yet that I can be thankful because God's perspective is different. And he's working something in me that he couldn't have ever worked any other way. And I took that verse and I said, Lord, I don't know how, but in some way I want to bring you glory in this process. Right? Right? Because now when I'm sitting at the hospital and I see someone that has gone through the cancer journey, I can empathize in a deeper way than ever before. And, and we start talking and have conversations, and I try and encourage them. Right? I was sitting one time at Truman. Well, I can't remember what I was waiting for. And I saw this lady, and she I, I could tell she was in the thick of, of treatment. She had her hat on. Her hair was gone. You know, she just, and I just, I, I was getting ready to leave, and I felt like I, I said, go pray for her. The Holy Spirit told me, and I went, and I said, you know what, I, I just came through. I'm about a year cancer-free, and can I pray for you? And her face lit up. And then I started seeing she, she was a Christian. She was a believer. I started looking at what she had in her hand, and she had these encouraging, you know, Christian books and things. And, and she told me what church she goes to, but she just lit up at that. I just said, I've been there. I know God can heal you. Can I pray with you? And she took my hand, and I just simply prayed with her, and then I moved on. You know, I, I probably never would have even been aware of those signs before, right? Don't get mad because you're suffering right now. Because if you will give that suffering to God, He will work in you something that is deeper and more profound than you ever could have do seen done otherwise. That's why Paul says, Always rejoice, constantly pray, and in everything give thanks. You know what you think? Well, Paul had a privileged life. He could say that. No. If you read his writings, we can see that Paul suffered with some physical ailment. Most people believe that it was a problem with his eyes that was unpleasant to look at, meaning it was probably weeping and pussing. That's why he had to have somebody write many of his letters. And he says, see what large letters I write to you. And so when he would write, he couldn't see well enough that he could write small. So he would have to put portions very largely. And he prayed, Lord, can you take this away from me? Three times, the word says. And God's response was, my grace is sufficient. For I'm in your weakness, I'm made strong. Embrace the suffering. 
embrace the low point of life and look along and see the others. God is calling us to give thanks for God-given leadership. He's, he's telling us, give thanks for the weaker brother. Do what you can to minister. Every member a minister in everything, in fact, give thanks. Let me challenge you this week as it's the 2nd of November. I've already seen Jeannie's already one step ahead of me. She started her thanks posts already. Let me encourage you, if you're on Facebook every day, post something you're thankful for. If you're not on Facebook, you can do something even more because you never know who's going to read your pa- Facebook posts, right? You don't know if anybody sees it. It just goes out there into nowhere and nobody sees it. If you're not on Facebook or even if you are, I'd encourage you to find somebody that you're thankful for and tell them in a face-to-face conversation if possible, in a phone call if they're too far away, in that handwritten letter that I so remember getting from our sister Catherine Wallace who used to sit right there behind where Ed's sitting. Be remembered for being thankful every day. Every day. Let it be a reminder. You can thank God. You can thank people. You can thank God and people. And take these things and, and just remember them and apply them. Let me just encourage you this morning as we close, could you stand with us today? If you're this morning going through that low point of life, that suffering point, that thing that you really don't feel like you can rejoice in or be thankful for, and you want prayer this morning, I want to pray for you. As we, we, we were praying earlier for the persecuted church, maybe you're here today and you are just feeling persecuted by life and you would like prayer, I want to encourage you to come this morning, and I promise you won't come alone. If you need prayer before we leave this place today, I want to just pray the Holy Spirit empower you and strengthen you to not give up in the middle of the fight. And if that's you, I just want to encourage you this morning, before we dismiss, that we would pray, have an opportunity to pray with you and surround you today.